Heavenly Father, as we take up our study this morning, we once again ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask for an extra measure of discernment that we can begin to make these chiasms and these uh, patterns of time um, something that we understand and own for ourselves. Please bless us with that insight in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, where I want to start today is over here. Before I, I'm going to erase this, but in your notes, you'll see on the top of page one, an email I got from Theodore. And that graph there on your, your notes shows that uh, Enoch was born 622 years from creation. Okay, so that's that. That's just adding to this. If you remember yesterday when we were looking at June 22nd, we found that um, 622 BC, 622 AD are way marks, and Theodore's just thrown into the mix if you want to see it, that 622 years after the creation, Enoch is born. Okay? Um, now, what I'm going to do here this morning before we return to the notes that we're on, Emmanuel brought up something yesterday, and I, I want to address it as we start. I think I'll probably have to just take it all off. I was going to try to use some of it, but... Emmanuel had heard me say something at some point in time, and he reminded me of it yesterday. I don't remember saying it, but I don't doubt that I said it. And then he had a follow-up thought about it. And I followed his logic a little bit, but um, there was a part of his logic I didn't fully understand. So I'm going to run this by you. This here is what I've been calling the midnight chiasm. And I'm convinced that it really doesn't matter with these chronological patterns on two points. If we can't learn them for ourselves, there, there's no benefit. And, but even if you learn them for yourself, if you're not beginning to see the applications that are represented by them, then there's no benefit. There's, you, we have to learn these, and then we have to become familiar with them enough to start drawing some conclusions. Like this one here. When we went through, and I know I was going pretty fast on Sabbath, when we went through Donald Trump, that was pretty much a review. There may have been a couple things on Donald Trump that we threw in that was new. But one of them I think was probably new is that from Donald Trump declaring that he was going to run from pre for president until he got the nomination from the Republican Party, how many days was that? <clears throat> it's in your notes from Sabbath, if you were here. It was 977 days. So what does that mean? in this history of 777. And I would argue that 977 is a symbol of, of probably many things. Counterfeit midnight cry message we know because there's Jeroboam putting a, an idol in Dan and an idol in Bethel. Uh, there's doublings in the story of Jeroboam. But one thing at the most simple level about 977 is a divided kingdom. And I'll, I'm arguing that from the day that Donald Trump declared that he was running for presidency until the day that he won the nomination, that the liberal and conservatives in the United States were separated forever. That's the beginning of the Civil War. There's no, there's no public relations campaign you could do right now to bring the Democrats and Republicans back together. During that 977-day period, there, it's... It's never turning back, and I'm basing that up on the number 977. In 977 BC, 
the kingdom of Israel that was divided into the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. So I'm saying 977, among other things, is a symbol of separation. Okay, so this is the midnight chiasm. And what Emmanuel brought up the other day, and I may not reflect exactly what he said, um, but I know where I'm going, so you don't have to correct me if I miss something. It's not, I'm not trying to misrepresent you. Um, he said he heard me once say that this is 1863. And we know there's 63 days here and 63 days here. And there's even 63 weeks that go, that go to another way mark over here that we're not dealing with. And uh, so... He was saying that this would be 1989 because 126 days from 1863 would take you to 1989. And that's how we apply. The, um, but he was conjecturing that this midpoint would be 1888. And, and uh, that wasn't sinking for me. It wasn't clicking. Um, but, it, and then I remembered later, after our discussion, we've already established this. It's 1926. Okay, now, this is, we've established this in terms of not looking at the midnight, but in terms of 126. The 126, it begins in 1863 and goes to 1989. In your notes, um, you see in the box, it says, 1926, the Seventh-day Adventist working policy number 75 was adopted. This working policy number 75, if anyone has the ability to dig it out, it would be nice, but it seems to me that the Seventh-day Adventist church has purposely hidden it. You, they tell you, if you go to their general conference websites, they tell you they have it, but that you have to be one of their elite, they don't use the word elite, but you have to be a general conference high echelon employee to get to see it. But it, it's, there's enough of it out there through history that if you go, to do, if you go search it on the website, you'll find many of these uh, dissident Adventist groups through the years have got enough of the policy that was accepted in 1926 that they quote from it. But I, w I wanted to have the complete document if it exists. And it's a policy they put in place in 1926 that at different general conference sessions they'll update, they'll update. They have a working policy now that maybe they updated at the last general conference session. I don't know. But the one that came in in 1926, um, the part that you'll find everyone quotes is right here. This, this is from the 1926 Ecumenical working policy, number 75 from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We recognize those agencies that lift up Christ before men as a part of the divine plan for the evangelization of the world, and we hold high esteem Christian men and women in other communions who are engaged in winning souls to Christ. So in 1926, um, they accepted a working policy that anyone that professes to be winning souls to Christ, they can work with, with open hearts and open minds. And so on the subtitle of the next quote there from the Spirit of Prophecy, if you're not familiar with it, we call them Jesuits. But what is the real name of the Jesuits? The Jesuit or? Society of Jesus. The Society of Jesus. Okay, so they profess to be evangelizing for Jesus. So when you accept this working policy in 1926, it's even broad enough that you can accept the premise of working with Jesuits. Okay, um, so when we've looked at this history in the past in terms of the 126s for our history, if this is the 126 that begins in 1863, and if you put 1926 here, then you can go back here seven years to 1919. And then 1926, 1863, 1989. And this seven-year period here becomes 
significant when you re remember that this 126 here is a, one of two 126s. Okay, we have a, a 126 that begins in 1863, and we have another 126 that begins in 1888. This one ends at the time of the end in 1989, and this one ends in 2014. This is 126, and this is 126. But the significance of this is this is paralleling Millerite history. Because Millerite history, you don't have two 126s, it has two 2520s. Okay, this is important understanding for where we're at with chronology and time patterns. This 2520 begins in 723 and it ends at the time of the end in 1798. By the way, everyone watching this should be able to teach this. This should, this should be established in your minds by now. This is, this is the very launching point for time. If you can't defend this, this right here, then you are accepting the premise of time without having any foundation to do so. Okay, this is this 2126, this was 2520, and this 2520 began when? 677, and it went to where? 1844. Now we've been going, we've dealt with this a lot. This is, this is our justification for the 126, is that the structure of the 2520 in the Millerite history, the beginning of Adventism, is identical to the structure up here, okay? This is the time of the end, this is the time of the end. Um, this is both uh, 1844 and also 1888. It's 1888 because this 126 begins in 1888 and Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. So 2014 will have to have the characteristics of 1888 just based upon this. But based upon this structure, this second 2520 ended in 1844. So you need to see 1844 illustrated here too. You need to see 1844 and 1888 right here. This is big stuff. It's big stuff. This is what Parminder tried to destroy. So you know without even understanding what it is, the fact that Satan did so much effort to destroy it that it's important. Okay, so I'm just reminding us of that. Okay, but now let me remind us of something else. This 2520, we don't divide it in the middle, do we? This one down here. But up here we divide it in the middle. Okay, right in here we put 538. Okay, so what I'm now I'm going back over here. This is this is 723, 538, 1798, and it's typifying 1863, 1926, 1989. Okay, you see it here? So 1919 is typifying over here 508. Okay, 508 is 30 years in here, but over here it's seven years. Okay, so, so what we've taught on a regular basis, this isn't new, is that um, in this particular 2520, this one here, where you have paganism followed by papalism, we stand on William Miller's expression on Millerite understanding that in Daniel 8.13, the Daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation is two desolating powers. One, paganism, a desolating power that is outside of God's people. And two, papalism, a desolating power that is inside of God's people. Okay, so that's how the pioneers, Miller defined it, two desolating powers. 
one on the outside, one on the inside. That's this illustrated in this history here, paganism, papalism. So when we take this history and say it's typifying this up here, this is this up here, then we find that the problems of four generations will slide into darkness of Adventism begins with a period of time, 63 years, where the problems that are brought up on Adventism are brought up on Adventism by themselves from the inside. But when you get to 1919, you have the Doctrine of Christ, W.W. W. Prescott, uh, published and promoted, presenting a new gospel to Adventism, a new Christ. And from this point on, it opens the door to uh, the, the hermeneutics of apostate Protestantism and Catholicism. So in this history here, you have the daily getting taken away, in, if we're going to use the terms from the 2520, and you're transcending into a new type of desolating power, and here it's the desolating power outside of Adventism. They're reversed. They're reversed. What I mean they're reversed is in the 2520, First, the desolating power of paganism that is outside of God's people confronts it for 1260 years. And then the desolating power that is inside of God's people, the, the papalism, desolates it for 1260 years. But in this line, it's reversed. First, the problems are internal and then they are external. This is all review so far. Okay, so what I'm wanting us to see here is where we have to get to. And where we have to get to is this. This chiasm, which, which I'm calling the midnight chiasm, is a chiasm that's based upon 63 and 63 or 126. So as a student of prophecy, what would that tell you? It would tell you that any chiasm that you find that is 6363, should be able to be laid right over the top of this. Yes? Okay. So, so therefore, what went on in, on September 7th, uh, it was typified by 1863. Okay, and what was the, the 1863 was what? It was a lot of things, but we'll keep it simple. It was rebellion, was it not? setting aside the, the two tables, starting a church, a new church. So on 9-7, we should see rebellion and a starting of a new movement, or not a, or establishing of a new movement. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying you can show the, the characteristics of 1863 lining up here, and you... Pardon me? Oh, yeah, but I'm just, I'm just not being real specific about starting. They started it back here. This is where they brought it out in the open. You can throw 977 Jeroboam in here, right? 977 because September 7th took place on what? On a Sabbath. Okay, so you got 977 there. What did Jeroboam do on, in 977? He set up those two golden calves and he had the identical statement the identical policy statement of who? It's word for word. Aaron. Aaron. Aaron had set up a, 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 an idol when they came out of Egypt. And, and I don't know the word for word, but it's in both cases it's this. This is thy God, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. That's what Aaron says when he makes the golden calf. And that's what Jeroboam repeats when he puts his two idols in here in Bethel and Dan, church and state. So, what is 1863? It's in Ezekiel 8, it's the image of jealousy. And the image of jealousy you can show is Aaron's golden calf, and you can show it's Jeroboam. So, 1863, with this 126, at least this way, Mark, is lining up perfectly with the midnight chiasm. Now, as we proceed through this, this is what I want you to see. What, this point I'm going to make here. Right here on 11.9, 9, 
Where is that? Where, have, where do I go to when I talk about 11.9? Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. It's the 30th year. November 9th, 30th year, 2019. Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. And Ezekiel, what happens to Ezekiel? The heaven is opened and he sees the wheels within the wheels. This here, this chiasm, it's where you should expect to see the wheels within the wheels. So what I'm saying is, is you, you, we have to understand now that the places that we see these chiasms, 63 and 63, they're brought right in here into the sanctuary and they are the wheels within the wheels that at first seem very confusing, but they produce perfect order. So here in 1926, this here from 1919 to 1926 is showing the transition in the 2520 from paganism to papalism. It's a time of preparation. Um, and so over here from 508 to 538, can you give me another line that plugs in there? that illustrates the 30-year the tr tr transition from paganism to papalism? Because if you can, it would go right here. And you can. Right here is 4 BC, is it not? How old was Christ when he was baptized? The, the wicked one. The I was period. going to say Jesus' life, yeah. Okay, so that's 27. Okay, so we could do more with that, right? We could take now from 27 all the way out here to 34. I am not going to do more with that. I'm trying to just right now uh, make an argument that this here, midnight, in the sanctuary, is where the wheels with the wheels all come together. This is the point of reference, right here, 11.9. By the time you get here, and this is what I want you to see, it's lining them up with 1989. What is 1989 and 1798? Increase of knowledge. Time the end, increase of knowledge. What's another expression along those lines with those two statements? Where, what's the other expression um, that we get from Daniel? Unsealed. The book of Daniel is unsealed. What have we been teaching about 111? The book of Daniel is unsealed at 111. Because Gideon went down into the camp and heard the dream and the interpretation thereof. So 1989 is agreeing with this way mark. Wheels within wheels. What, uh, what is 1989? It's typified by what? 1798. So where does 1798 begin. Well, you can say it begins here in 538, right? You'd have an argument there. Or you can take it all the way back over to here, can't you? You could put 538 here based upon the divided 2520. <coughs> or you could put it over here too. Can you? Yes, you can, but, but I, I don't want to belabor that point. All I'm trying to make us see now is how these lines come together at midnight. Yes? Isn't that based on the study you did that the times of pointed and the time of the ends, wherever you see either one of those, they're interchangeable in Daniel? Is that the concept you're using to put it back there? To put what back there, 538? 1798 back with 1863 and 19, 977. Well, that would add to it. I'm, I'm using, all I'm using now is 
all I'm dealing with now is the 126. What is 63? It's 126. It's 252. It's 2520. So this is, is 63, but it can also be 126. 151 is another story. So um, now to your notes. You can notice this in that box I left out reading Great Controversy. What, what I have that there is in 1926, the working policy that the Seventh-day Adventist Church accepted uh, opened the door that they could work with the Jesuits. I'm just using the Jesuits as the extreme example because we see Jesuits popping up over and over again in our line in terms of Fatima. Um, but the quote here, Sister White isn't speaking specifically about Jesuits. She's speaking about the Catholic Church. Does the Catholic Church profess to be a follower of Christ? Because if they do, it means in 1926, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was open to working, evangelizing with Catholics. So Sister White says in Great Controversy 571, the papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics nor persons suspected of heresy. She declares, shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as part of of the Church of Christ. No way. Okay. So the, the, she's speaking about the Catholic Church in general, but this working policy opens up to working with the Catholics, but I'm putting an emphasis on the Jesuits because of their name. That's the working policy, the part I quoted there. All you have to do is profess to be a follower of Christ, and the name for the Jesuits is the Society of Jesus. So, pardon me. Elder, yes. Uh, Nineteen uh, two two points on that line. Nineteen twenty six was also the year that the Seventh Day Adventist Church accepted Froome's teaching on the Trinity. But if you're going to have this this line complete, should you also not have a seven year period after nineteen eighty nine? Oh, for because what? Because wasn't that the publication of the Time of the Year magazine? Yeah. Well, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I we can we can put a, a several way marks, but so okay, we put the seven years here to nineteen ninety six. What are you trying to show? Same thing as what was being shown okay. from seven twenty three to eighteen forty four. Seven twenty three to eighteen forty four. That, okay, all, all I'm saying is this way, Mark, we got seven years before. This way, Mark, we got seven years after. Correct. Okay, so, all right, but I'm not dealing with this right now. Okay, I get your point, I, and we may get there, but I'm going to keep it at a more basic level till I think we're all on the same wavelength. Thank you. side point on that this willing to work with, with anyone who claims to be preaching Christ. Yep. On another level too, you could even add spiritualism because Sister White in Great Controversy says that spiritualism tries to imitate Christianity or something close to that. You could. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to stir up, a, I won't, this won't stir up no hornet's nest, but yeah. Pentecostalism is spiritualism. Yeah. Okay, that's spiritualism. That, and they all profess to be Christians. And there's a lot of varieties of spiritualism. But I mean, if you just want to put a Christian label on it, that's a simple one for me. So on page two of your notes, I have the, the graph of this history here, the midnight chiasm. And it goes out here. I'm not going to deal much with the 63 weeks. It's just part of that graph, and I don't know how to make graphs, so I have to rob other people's graphs, and I get more than I need lots of times. 
okay, or that I want. Underneath it, I want you to see that, that this is the, this here, underneath this graph on page two, is the Italian camp meeting. Okay, from June 9th to uh, October 13th. is 126 days, 63, 63, and this is 2018. Okay, and the, the center of it was August 11th. So, what's that saying about here? And here, how, how do these way marks speak to the midnight, uh, ca the midnight chiasm? The, what I'm saying is, we've already discussed this recently. What is this chiasm about? It's about Islam. It's about Islam. What, what miracle took place on June 9th, 2018? The 9-11 opening Sabbath, uh, ending that presentation right on that time, or, or starting Sabbath at that time, I forget which is which, there was two Italian camp meetings. Was it ending on June 9th, the Sabbath? Okay, it ended right at 9-11. What was the presentation about? 9-11. What is August 11th, 2018, the center of this chiasm? August 11th, no, August 15th is the midnight cry. What's August 11th? August 11th is 1840. It's about Islam, isn't it? It's about the restraint placed upon Islam. This is about 9-11. Is 9-11 about Islam? Is August 11th about Islam? How is October 13th? Someone said Fatima. I get that, but that's not, that's not, that isn't what the Lord um, revealed on October 13th. What was the, the element that was revealed on October? Pardon me? Second witness to November 9th. Second witness to November 9th. And what, how was that second witness produced? It was produced from the 391 and a half year prophecy from the history of, from the prophecy of Josiah with Ezekiel, from the history of Revelation 9, from the history of Samuel Snow, and the 391 and a half year symbol is a symbol of Islam. Okay, so Islam on October 13th, 2018 is confirming November 9th, August 11th is Islam, and June 9th is 9-11, it's Islam, right? So how does this tie in with the midnight chiasm? Pretty simple to me. One of the wheels that is opened up at midnight is about Islam. Okay, it's, a, it's one of the truths, one of the lines of truth that the Lord opens up here in this history. Right? Okay, underneath that graph, um, you have the the connection between this here, the, this particular way mark, there are, what is it? There's a chiasm in here. It's not the chiasm we're looking at, but we have mentioned it. It's 164.5 days by 164.5 days. And when you get over here, where are you? At the end of this chiasm. And the center of this chiasm here was 327. Pardon me? So when you get over here, you, you think you're at March 27th. 
You're at nine seven. What what is this chiasm here? It's this one here. It's this one here. Yeah. This is eleven nine and one eleven. Sixty three. Sixty three. What did we what were we suggesting about this whole line? Okay, what we were suggesting is, is that we have a chiasm in this history here. Pretty profound chi chiasm about March 27th, but that it's, it's preceded by a chiasm of 126, 63, 63, and it's followed by a chiasm of 126, 63, 63. And we identified this one as Islam, a message about Islam that came from where? From the book of Revelation. Where does this message come from? Daniel. Okay. So this light is bookend, bookended by Daniel and Revelation. By the message of the East, tidings of the East. And tidings of the North. Okay, so, do you see a secondary justification for putting this 126 under this 126 that I haven't mentioned up to this point? But you should know. I mean, I'm, I'm saying I have the right to do it as a student of prophecy just because the symbols are the same. I can bring 126 on 126. But now you have a secondary witness for justification for doing it. What is it? Okay, because Revelation and Daniel are the same book. I wasn't looking for that one, but okay, that's a second witness. I'm still looking for my witness. I'm call it the third witness. What is it? It's that this history is the beginning that leads to this, the heart of this chiasm, and this is the end. Right? Do you see it? So does Jesus illustrate the end with the beginning? So, so, so you, now we put three witnesses up there. We can put this line with this line because they're both 126s. But we can also put this line with this line because this is the book of Revelation and this is the book of Daniel. And Sister White says they're the same book. But this history here is the beginning of this giant chiasm, and this is the end, so we can put it here. All I'm doing at this point is arguing that we have the right to do that. And that's my, where I started this morning. We have to become familiar with these chronologies, point one, and some of us aren't doing that because we're saying, well, I'm not mathematically inclined or whatever, or this is over my head. Or maybe it's partially because the people that are teaching these things are not good teachers. So they have a little bit of responsibility to bear because they haven't been clear. But at this close to the end of the world, that excuse is not going to save you. You have to put your, your nose to the grindstone and come to grips with these chronological revelations. That's just step one. Step two is then to determine what they symbolically represent and bring them together line upon line because it's all meaningless if you can't understand what message is being conveyed when they're brought together line upon line. Okay, so at this point, all I'm trying to do is show that based upon the rules of prophetic application that we've used from the very beginning of this movement, that this line here is a symbol. It's symbol 126. And as a student of prophecy, we have the authority to bring this symbol 126 and this symbol 126 together line upon line. Okay? Yes? And now I'm giving you the, the actual testimony of two or three to establish it so that you know that this application is not just simply line upon line, but it's also beginning and end, Daniel and Revelation, east, north. Okay? And I'm, and I'm trying to show that when we do this, 
at midnight is where the wheels are within the wheels. And this is where the light is produced from. This is where the light comes from, is the sanctuary. Based upon Ezekiel 1.1 as a simple point of reference. Okay. Next page. Page 3. I'm going to take these off. We've looked at this before. Samuel Snow's history. In Samuel Snow's history, there is a chiasm. Samuel Snow's history, about the time that, that the Lord started bringing Samuel Snow's history to light is where the real animosity of Satan began to come in. Um, some of us began teaching this. I taught it a few times. Um, but it was being set aside by this movement. This was before the parting of the ways. So maybe because of that, if you're still hanging on to this, um, if you're still walking on this narrow path, maybe back then you didn't wrap your mind around it. But Samuel Snow's history of the midnight cry, as illustrated in his letters and when they were published, is an absolute essential key to having confidence in this chronology that we're dealing with. And in, in your notes on page three, you'll see this, this structure of Samuel Snow. And there once again is a 126 day chiasm in that. It begins on February 16th. Um, the center of the chiasm. Samuel Snow did not write a letter or have anything published at the center of this chiasm. The other way marks on here are dealing with his writing of a letter or a publishing of a letter. But what is the center of this chiasm? It's the first day of the first month. And what's the first day of the first month? It's April 19th. It's the first disappointment. It, what, go, what went on here technically? I'm saying technically. What went on in Millerite history on April 19th, 1844? The Protestants were fully separated forever from the Millerite movement. Right? They may have really been separated back here in heart and mind, but when they reach this way mark here, it's all over, right? Amen. Is that not how we understand it as Seventh-day Adventists? They have rejected the first angel's message and they are gone into darkness. So what would that tell you about here on November 9th, 2019? What is that speaking to? Is that speaking to the relationship with this movement and the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No, no way. Seventh-day Adventist Church, it, it has been bypassed when? 1989. Okay, That's, this is speaking to this movement. Was there a... a anyway... What you're saying is the same thing Sister White says in relation on a different level between Babylon the papacy and Babylon the fallen Protestant churches. She says the papacy, she fell a long time ago. This is applying especially now to the apostate Protestant churches. This is a great controversy, 389 or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so I, that isn't, I'm not trying to make this the big point of Samuel Snow's chiasm, I'm trying to just let us see along the way that these waymarks are speaking to our history. Okay, the, the last waymark there in this chiasm is what? I'm going to take this off. It's not germane to what I'm doing. The last waymark in this chiasm is What's June 22nd? <laughs> Is June 22nd anything? Okay, so as you go into Samuel Snow's history as represented in his letters and his publications, we can look at this now. I can read through it with you. There's 126 days from February 16th 
to June 22nd. He wrote a letter on February 16th. That letter is going to get published twice. Okay, it's going to get published in the Midnight Cry. It's going to get published in the Signs of the Times. Two publica Millerite publications in that history. But it's written on February 16th, so this is a way mark where, where we start it. Um, the, I'm going to skip over that first paragraph and come back to it. The dates are the writing of the first letter, February 16th, and it was published twice, first in the Midnight Cry on February 22nd. It's published here on February 22nd, 2.22. And then again, um, in the Signs of the Times on April 3rd, 4.3. Okay, and we're heading to 419. So my, it's not actually very um, accurate to the, what do they call that? Scale. What? <coughs> scale. Scale. It's not accurate to scale. Question? Yeah. It published the February 16th letter two times, but was it sent out on February 16th to somebody? Yeah, that's what was going on. And Samuel Snow's writing letters, and he's sending it in to these different Millerite publishing houses, and they determine whether they're going to publish it or not. And so it, it just so happened that when the letter that they publish, it has, he writes the date that he wrote it, and then he mails it to him or hands it off to him, I don't know which, and then they end up publishing it, The Midnight Cry and The Signs of the Times here. Um, the, and it just so happens that February 22nd is the, dedication to, is the date that the temple was dedicated in 515 B.C. So this is a, a biblical date, something happened on this date, 515 B.C. And this date here is... The Jewish Passover, and by that, I mean that Samuel Snow, the Millerites, were grappling with various calendars. They had to transcend from Julian to Gregorian calendar, and they had to determine which biblical calendar they were going to use. And the two biblical calendars that they were grappling with were the rabbinical calendar and the Karaite calendar. And the rabbinical calendar is much more flawed than the Karaite calendar. And the Karaite calendar, compared to what we call the biblical calendar, it, even the Karaite calendar has some flaws in it. We use the biblical calendar now. But the rabbinical cal calendar had this, as, this date as Passover. It was wrong. It really wasn't Passover if, if you were going to follow the biblical counsel. The reason that I make that point is because in this history, the Protestants that are going to close their door right here, one of the reasons they're going to close their door is they're using Protestant hermeneutics, they're the biblical methodology of apostate Protestantism. It's not apostate Protestantism yet, but it's going to become apostate Protestantism right here. And what leads them to this problem is they're depending upon Protestant hermeneutics instead of fully settling into the rules of William Miller. Okay, so what that means is over here we're going to have another waymark that is the actual Passover. So May, um, the second letter addressing the midst of the week. This is the heart of Samuel Snow's argument. What is the heart of Samuel Snow's argument? Where is the heart of Samuel Snow's argument on this board? This is the week. This is 27, 31, 34. And so he writes an article here on, the, on May 2nd. Okay, so I better put it up here. That's 5-2, right? Mm -hmm. And the writing of that article is actually the actual Passover. So what do you see in all that? The counterfeit is preceding the true. And the counterfeit is, is causing these people that are following the counterfeit to close their door right here. But the true gets confirmed over here. Okay, so up here, 
in this history, we should see the counterfeit accepting hermeneutic principles from apostate Protestantism and Catholicism that closes the door on them right here, but the Lord is going to confirm the true methodology right after that. You see that? That's in Samuel Snow's history that is, that is being illustrated. Okay, um, And the third letter is written on June 22nd, which is the sixth day of the third month. What's the sixth day of the third month? 63. That's this up here. 63 days, 63 days, 63 weeks. 63 weeks. Now, the, the paragraph I missed, uh, that I skipped over, just so you, if you're going to look at this chart, you know what it, what's being represented here. This chart goes from June 22nd to July 18th. And if you just look at the chart, you may be wondering how from June 22nd to July, June, July, how that can be 391 and a half days. But it, it's, it's projecting to the next year. Okay, it says, while there's actually only 26 days between June 2nd and July 18th, if we count from noon, June 22nd, here, 391.5 days, we will arrive at midnight commencing July 18th of the following year. This is what we did to confirm November night prediction by counting 391 days from noon, October 13th, 2018. So this is simply an extension that, is, is he, that we read back into that history and uh, could see this, this structure. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that in Samuel Snow's history, we have a 63 and a 63 at 126, and that we have the responsibility to understand what is symbolically represented in these waymarks, and then we have a secondary responsibility to bring that line into here. I'm saying this is the point of reference, that the midnight chiasm is the point of reference. Why am I saying that? Because in Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, this is all opened up at midnight, November 9th, 2019, in the 45th president of the United States, because it was the fourth day of the fifth month, or was it the fourth month of the fifth day in Ezekiel 1.1? 1, 1? Fifth day of the fourth month. Okay, so that's 45th president of the United States in the 30th year. And the 30th year takes you back to where? Where does it take, it back, take you back to? This is my point. No, in the 30th year here of Ezekiel 1.1, what is Ezekiel referencing by the 30th year? Where does it take you back to? Our line, Not our line. If you go from the date, the actual date that Ezekiel is writing, and you go 30 years backward, I think we explained this on Sabbath or the presentation before, it takes you to Josiah's Passover. When was Josiah's Passover? 622. So this 30th year is emphasizing what? June 22nd, 622, right? And 622, which is Josiah's Passover, is speaking to what? 622 B.C. is speaking to 622 A.D. What was 622 A.D.? That's Muhammad fleeing Mecca. And when in 622 did Muhammad flee Mecca? July 18th. Okay, so 622, the 30th year, is the 30th year since Josiah's Passover in 622. So you're seeing here a wheel within a wheel, are you not? Okay, what wheels are you seeing here with 622, the 30th year? You're seeing Josiah's Passover. You're seeing the, 
Muhammad fleeing Mecca in 622 AD. You're seeing July 18th in that wheel. And you're seeing it confirmed here in Samuel Snow's history that is parallel to the history of the Italian camp meeting that is parallel to the 126 from 1863 and 1989 that is parallel to this 126 and this 126 prophetically is parallel to what? Okay, and you can't know probably that I've asked you too many questions. I'll show you. I'm going to put another parallel up here. Everyone, everyone follow Samuel Snow's line now? I'm going to go back to where we started, sort of. This 126, 1863 to 1989, can be paralleled with this 126. Now, I know they start at different dates, but simply as symbols, you can bring them together line upon line. Right? Yeah. Okay, so if we're going to bring this together, line upon line, we would put uh, we, we would put a bigger board here, so I could really go. But 1888 to 2014. Okay. So you see the premise of this. This is not a 63, 63. This is a 126 to a 126. Yes? Okay, so I want to show you another wheel here. And I'm going to walk you through it if you'll, if you'll walk with me. We've put in the record here recently that when it comes to opening up Rafi and Paneum in Daniel 11, that the Lord purposely connected it with Isaiah 7 and onward. Because that's where the Assyrian flood comes up to the neck, okay, and leaves the head. And it's your second witness in Daniel 11 to him coming up to the borders of Egypt, which gives you the witness that Russia was the king of the south when the Soviet Union was taken away. So we've made that connection with Isaiah 7 and onward, that vision. But where, what is Isaiah 7's vision in terms of the 2520? It is this, the, the point of reference for this big chiasm, okay? Because where does it begin? It begins back here. Where does Isaiah 7 begin? 742. And it talks about, this is really out of sync. I'm going to put it down here. So I don't, 742 goes to 723 goes to 677 in Isaiah 7. This is 65 years, correct? And it's divided into 19 and 46. And then 19 on the other end. And 19 on the other end when you get down to 1844 to 1863. Okay, so 742 would be what? <clears throat> you, you took us there. 742 would be 1989. <clears throat> What, what, what would 742 be? If this is the beginning, what is the end of this chiasm over here? Is that not it? 742 has to be 1863. At this level, right? Beginning, end. Yes? Yeah. I'm telling you, we have to be able to do this for ourselves. Uh, Brother Jeff isn't going to be here to do it for you when you're standing before the, the laws of the land. Yeah. And, you, and you have to have it in your head well enough to be able to bring it together line up on line to derive the message from it. The Lord's trying to teach us a message in the sanctuary. He's not just trying to give us a bunch of numbers to memorize. So if 742 is the beginning and 742 is 1863, can we put 742 right here? Okay, so let's put 742 right here. 
And where does 742 go to? What's the end? 1863? I'm going to say the end is 723. What I mean is, that's a line. This is a line. If I can provide a second witness to 19 being a line, then it's a line. Okay, let me see if... I'm, I'm saying that 1863 is 742, right? Even if you haven't bought it yet. Even if you haven't bought into that. I'm saying that this is 1863. You've accepted my logic, right? Because this is the beginning, this is the end. Say amen if you follow me. But you've already accepted the logic that 1863 is 977 B.C. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so 977 B.C., you have Jeroboam in setting up the ten northern tribes. How many kings of the northern tribes were there? Ten. Nineteen. There were nineteen. That takes you to Hosea down here. That's a second witness that this 19 is a period of time. It begins in 977, it begins in 1863, it begins in 742, and it ends in... Tribes. Oh, you mean 19 years. kings. Kings, okay. For, did I say tribes? Okay, it's 19 kings from Jeroboam the first to Hosea in Israel, the northern tribe. How many kings were there in Judah? Just to check your memory of the recent past. 20. Remember? Okay, so what I'm saying is 742 is September. And what happened in 742? What happened in 742 that leads to Hosea in 723? Who is Isaiah dealing with in 742? Ahaz, a wicked king. What has Ahaz did? Ahaz, right here, Ahaz has counterfeited God's worship. How did he do that? He shut down the sanctuary in Jerusalem sent his high priest to Syria, had his high priest make plans of the Syrian temple and come back to Judah and build a counterfeit temple in the courtyard of God's sanctuary. This is wicked Ahaz. So right here in 742, you have Isaiah coming to Ahaz. And where do you find that story? In Isaiah chapter 7. This is a wheel. Isaiah's chapter 7 is in here. And in Isaiah's message to Ahaz, what is his message? Where does he give his message? He's at a certain place. There's two elements to it. He's by the Fuller's Field on the highway, the Fuller's Field, and he's by the the conduit from the upper pool. What's the conduit of the upper pool? It's Shiloh. What's Shiloh? Well, it's Siloam in the New Testament. But Siloam in the New Testament and Shiloh in the Old Testament is the waters. What's waters? Latter rain that are contrasted with the waters of Assyria in Isaiah's story. What's, what's Assyria's waters? It's Catholicism. So right here, you have two messages. One from Assyria, from Catholicism. And then you have Isaiah's message that is the message of Christ. Does Ahaz accept Isaiah's message? No way. He rejects it. Okay, so, so in this history, we should see on September 7th, 2019, a manifestation of a 
counterfeit worship right in the sanctuary itself. And that counterfeit worship is going to break down to Catholicism or true religion. Can you see it? Okay, that's a will within a will. And it's connected to Rafi and Paneum because it's in that passage where the head is defined for us that allows us to see Russia. And what is the root word of Siloam? A missile that is sent. A missile that's sent. And who is, who also has that root word in their name? Methuselah. And who was Methuselah's dad? And who was Lamech's dad? No, where's Enoch then? Is the son of Enoch. Enoch. Methuselah. And who's who's oh. Methuselah's son? Yeah, Lamech. Lamech. Are you sure? Enoch. Okay. Why do you need to be sure? Because there's a prophecy of seven hundred and seventy. Because yeah, Enoch. Go ahead. Yeah, Lamech. Okay, so it's <laughs> Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Okay, so what, who, what does Noah represent? The flood. Flood. Closed, door. Closed door. What does Enoch represent? I gave it to you the very first thing this morning. What does Enoch represent? Very first thing this morning. When was he born? 622 years after creation which is June 22nd, okay? And, and he, what does Methuselah, what's the root word of Methuselah? A missile that is sent. And what is Lamech? 777. And Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And Enoch represents June 22nd. Methuselah represents a missile that's sent. And Lamech represents the history of 777 that begins when? On November 9th, 2019, and ends when? On December 25th, 2021. And what does Noah represent? The, close of the closed door. So what together do those four represent? Four generations in this history that we're looking at, it's the final generation. There's a testing process that many are gonna fail, the testing of the four generations. But my point is, my point is, and I have to close because I have more 126 we'll have to take up next time. This history here, this first line, can be brought down to here based upon the witness of 19. So therefore, 723 is lining up with January 11th. And what happened in 723? The northern kingdom is taken away forever. Who would the northern kingdom be in this scenario? Okay, it would be Ahaz's false worship. It would be Jeroboam's false worship. It would be those, Aaron, it would be those that are studying the theology of Assyria, the king of the north, instead of Miller's rules, if you want to put it that way. Um, this is the closing of the door for them. And when they reach here, they have been taken into captivity forever. The Omega. The Omega. Okay, that doesn't speak that there isn't. With God's mercy, it's not speaking that it's 100%, because this would be what? At another level, it would be AD 34. Would it be AD 34? Because what would this be? 27, 31, 34. Could, could, they have dis could God have destroyed Jerusalem in AD 34 in fulfillment of prophecy? Yes, he could have, uh, but he didn't. He extended the time until 8070. For what reason does Sister White say? For the children and those that had, for whatever reason, been prevented from hearing the message. So I'm saying the Omega movement here, it's, it's gone. 
it's into captivity now for eternity. It's separated fully. And, but there may be some people that respond as illustrated in the time period from 34 AD to 80 70. But this is telling us, will within will, who's on the narrow path. Okay, and, and so I'll, I'll close here with my first thought. My first, one of my first arguments that I've made already twice. We have to learn these things, the math of these things, the numerical stuff. That's just step one. Step two is coming to grips with what they represent. Step three is bringing them together line upon line in order to know what God is speaking to us about these things. And my argument here this morning is, is that the point of reference is this chiasm, the midnight chiasm, because right here is where Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John have the sanctuary opened to them. And they see the wheels within the wheels. And what I've been showing here today is the wheels within the wheels. And I have several other wheels from this history to put on here before we return to our notes. And I wanted to get through the kingdom of the beast, but Emmanuel brought this question up yesterday and he sidetracked us. So it's all his fault. We'll, we'll come back to this tomorrow and finish off these lines. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life, another day to have opportunity to serve you. Um, we see great light that you are opening to your people at this time. And we ask that you would convict us of our need of personal consumption of this light, that we can make it our own, that we can use it uh, to open with the presence of your Holy Spirit, open your Bible to our mind and our hearts individually that we might be prepared for this coming crisis. We ask a blessing upon our day's uh, service for you. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.